Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for tonight's webinar, DCM Gene Therapy Advancement at Tanaya Therapeutics. I'm Jayanne Rock. I will be your host this evening. We'll give people a few more seconds to join here. Um, I hope everyone is finding a way to stay cool. I know it's hot in most of the country. <laughs> so um, hopefully you found, found a cool spot to, uh, to listen to tonight's webinar. It, it promises to be very interesting. Everyone's microphones are on mute upon joining so that we can hear the speakers clearly. If you have any questions, we ask that you please do use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Again, thank you for joining. Uh, tonight's webinar is DCM Gene Therapy Advancement at Tanaya Therapeutics. We're thrilled to have them with us tonight. And uh, so let's get rolling. The DCM Foundation is, was uh, actually launched in 2017, and our mission is to provide hope and support to patients and families with dilated cardiomyopathy through research, advocacy, and education. Again, just a reminder, an open Q&A session will follow tonight's presentation. So if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature of Zoom at any time you don't have to wait until we open up the Q&A portion of tonight's um, webinar. Next. First, we're gonna do a quick poll. Who is attending tonight's webinar? Are you a DCM patient, family member or friend, medical professional or industry professional? We like to do this poll at the beginning of every webinar just to gauge um, who's on. And, uh, oh, this is great, okay. Uh, give another second. Okay, let's share the results. Great, thank you. And by the way, we have Heather helping behind the scenes. So big thanks to Heather. Um, so 43% are DCM patients, 10% family member or friend and uh, medical professionals. And then we have industry professionals uh, a little bit more than a third. So that's fantastic. Well, we're very excited to get rolling tonight. So let's continue. So first we would like to thank our generous sponsor Tanaya without whose help we wouldn't um, be able to do a lot of this great programming that we do and our monthly webinars. Um, we provide webinars every single month. We have a big patient conference coming up in September. You wanna keep your eye out for that. Um, and we also have monthly newsletters and so forth. So big shout out to Tanaya for assisting us and supporting us without whose help we couldn't do this. Next. Thank you. So tonight's presenters, I'm very excited um, to have with us tonight, Ki Hong Kim, a PhD. He's the Chief Technology Officer at Tanaya. Dr. Kim joined Tanaya in 2018 as a Senior Vice President of Technical Operations. Since then, he's led efforts to internalize process development and quality control capabilities and he's overseen the establishment of Tanaya's CGMP manufacturing facility. Previously, and I'm gonna call him Kay because he prefers to be called Kay. <laughs> Previously, Kay held top leadership positions at several biopharma companies in the manufacturing of gene drug therapy. Dr. Kim, sorry, Kay, completed his postdoctoral training at Cornell University and his doctoral degree in chemical engineering from Colorado State University. Also joining us tonight is Scott Birch, who's from Tanaya. He's their executive director and clinical site head. Scott has 27 years of experience in the pharmaceutical and biotech field, specializing in the design, construction, automation, and validation of production facilities. Prior to joining Tanaya, Scott served as senior director of technical operations at Novartis Gene Therapies. So without further ado, I am very excited to um, now share the stage and turn it over to Kay and Scott. Take it away, guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much, Jay, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, on behalf of the then, uh, Tanaya Therapeutics, I'd like to uh, you know, greatly appreciate the DCM Foundation's uh, opportunity for us to introduce and uh, discuss what we have achieved so far and what is the, our mission and uh, what is the, our plan for uh, <clears throat> helping uh, the DCM uh, patients and the families. So uh, are we going to 
uh, slide, see the slide? Oh, okay, it's coming. There you go. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So today uh, I, I will take care of the first part of the presentation and uh, Scott is gonna take care of the, uh, the manufacturing side of the aspect of the presentation. So next slide. Okay, yeah, so we use a very eye chart and, but you know, Scott and I may uh, make some uh, forward looking uh, statements during the presentations. Those statements are the subject, saying, uh, subject to certain risks and uncertainties, which have been highlighted on this slide. A complete summary of the all business risks that the FNIA may face is included in our uh, filings in the uh, uh, weekly SEC website. So please refer to that. At, uh, next slide, please. So today's topic, we are going to uh, very quickly, uh, what is the, uh, the genetics behind of the uh, DCM? And what is the gene therapy and how can it be useful to treat the heart disease? And how we make the gene therapy for the product and how the DCM community can get involved for uh, our uh, journey together. Next slide. So uh, Tinaya's vision is to transform, extend the lives of the family the people and families to fighting heart disease. So our mission is to discover, develop, and deliver curative therapies that, uh, <clears throat> that, can, that, that needs to be addressed, the underlying cause of heart disease. And our therapies and capabilities are designed to provide the new hope and new options for millions of the individuals for orphan disease to the most prevalent form of the heart disease. So this is the more, uh, you know, comprehensive approach for the uh, for the patients and families with the heart disease. Next slide. So the Tinaya Therapeutic is a small startup company, but we have a very different heart because we 100% focus on heart disease only, no other disease. Because we have developed, we have a, a, a <clears throat> we have a, a developed. We have collected the resources and we have been able to lucky enough to develop our own the wonderful capabilities from the research to the manufacturing. Based on that, we have uh, developed a really strong pipeline and we are also facing a very exciting milestones this year. We have a completed the CGMP manufacturing facility construction and then is in the fully operational right now. And then we also have a published multiple uh, high level top tier publications using the, our uh, uh, preclinical data with the TN301 and the 401, as well as the capsid engineering. And uh, uh, please refer to our website in the publication section. You will be able to see the complete sets of the publications available. And we are also planning to buy two INDs in the next four months by the end of this year for the TN201 as well as the TN301. The so next slide will talk about the pipeline. So as you can see, the Tinaya Therapeutics have a three separate segments of the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, different modalities. The first one is the gene therapy, and the second one is the precision medicine, which is the small molecule drug product. And also we, have, we are developing a very innovative approach we call the cellular uh, regeneration. So today we are going to focus on the DCM. Right now we have a work which is the targeting of more than 1 million patients are under suffering. And then the, another one is focusing is the TN301, one of the, our lead product about to getting into the IND and uh, the clinical trial before is the gen uh, genetically defined, uh, the DCM. So the TN301 is the small molecule. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about too much about it. However, this is the small molecule approach, which is the uh, different, different modality from the gene therapy Today's talk is going to be a focus on uh, more dwarf and the other uh, the heart disease, the gene therapy product. Next slide. All right, so uh, genetics of the <clears throat> DCM is the uh, uh, very complicated. So next few slides, I try to visualize and simplify the how uh, the DCM <clears throat> is the uh, prevailing disease in the US and the, all around the world. So, the DCM, I, I'm not going to discuss all of these details. However, the DCM is the very widespread disease, and it is very serious outcome. 
the one third of the DCM, actually the DCM cases are uh, in heritage, which means there is an underlying genetic code by the mutated gene. And there are no treatments that target those underlying causes. So, uh, next slide. So this slide is also eye chart. As you can see, uh, the abnormalities in the DCM is caused by more than 50 genes can actually get involved to create the DCM. So as you can see, there are the many different structures of the, the uh, heart muscles. And uh, I'm not gonna go over all, all, all of this one, but this is the visualizing how many different components of the gene and the death product can actually involve and causing the DCM. So the, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, there's each star in this illustration indicates a gene that leads to the DCM when disrupted by a mutation. So this, this is the, uh, that's why it makes it very difficult to uh, cure or <clears throat> uh, improving the symptom by the DCM. So next slide. One more click, please. So this is the, uh, uh, the tabular form of the, uh, the each genes with the different prevalence. As you can see, there are the 20% of PTN as very, very much. So a lot of genes are already defined and those, those can be a target for many different modality of the actual product to uh, treat. However, each gene and targets have their own the problem and then their own the difficulty. However, the industry and including the Tanaya is to try to uh, come up with the most curable and most effective drug product. So this is the one of the reason why it is so important for uh, <clears throat> the patients and the families to involve in the genetic testing. So it can give us more information so we can pick out the best approach to uh, come up with the drug, which is the small molecule gene therapies or other therapies. We will we hope for the uh, many people in uh, <clears throat> participate in the genetic test. Next slide. Yes, so this is the uh, very complicated, but in the nutshell, the gene therapy is very simple. We come up with the target gene, which is the which with the 100% uh, complete natural uh, the therapeutic gene, and then we package into the vector. We call the adeno associated virus. We call AAV. So we put the gene inside of the, uh, the virus, and then the virus can get into the human body and then target to the myocyte itself. And then the gene is expressed inside of the target cell. And then the, the product of the gene, which is the protein, is the fixing the heart function. So that is the gene therapy. And uh, this is the, uh, a little bit complicated, but hopefully I, uh, I could give you a simplified version of the definition of the gene therapy. Next slide. As you can see, uh, for last over uh, 25, 30 years, uh, there was a very low level of the gene therapy uh, clinical trial uh, activities. So I, when I first started the gene therapy, it was 2012, that was very low. The last 10 years, it has been exponentially increased the number of the uh, gene therapy clinical trials. And then there are two already uh, <clears throat> FDA approved products in the US. And then there are uh, additional, a uh, couple of additional products has been also approved by the ex US. Next, please. So the, this is the work that one of the, our uh, research program targeting to the DCM. So the, uh, <clears throat> the work is uh, simplified, simply speaking, is the regulating the balance of the calcium influx and outflux of the sarcomere so uh, it can improve the ejection fraction. So uh, we are at the uh, currently at the candidate selection stage. And then hopefully uh, we can get this product also into the clinic as soon as possible. Next slide. Okay, so this is the end of the, uh, the general introduction of the DCM and the effort that we are doing in, uh, internally. So now the Scott is going to talk about a little more details about how we manufacture 
this adeno-associated virus based the gene therapy pattern to for the DC. But please take it away. Thanks, Kay. Uh, we always like to start with a slide like this to try to simplify what Kay was talking about with um, the complexities of, of what it takes to actually make um, an AAV. And if you were to think about things that you might already know um, in your household and industry, uh, the easiest thing to kind of start with is um, like a non steroidal anti-inflammatory like aspirin or leave. And that's about as complex as making a bicycle in our model. If you wanted to kind of step up to what would be a kind of the next level of complexity, you would go to some type of a, of a human growth hormone. And, and that would be more like trying to design and produce a car. Um, most of the products that you'll find today for other treatments are what they call antibodies or Im immunoglobulins. Uh, that'd be like your Humeras and your Keytrudas. And that's like trying to design and build an airplane. And what we're doing in our gene therapy with the AAV vector is kind of equivalent to building the international space uh, uh, program here. And you, you can kind of see that as we step through the different types of, of molecules that you can have, um, your aspirin is about 21 atoms, uh, human growth hormones, more like 3,000, your antibodies about 25,000, and an AAV vector well north of a million. So that just kind of gives you an idea of when we were talking about all of that DNA and gene replacement, gene substitution, it, it's an incredibly complex system. And the way that we kind of get through that is following the standard drug de development process. So uh, that's basically broken down into these five stages. You've got your discovery and development. This is kind of where research begins and they're looking at in a laboratory setting, how can they express and get the type of response that they're looking for. Um, if that turns out positive, move on to more of a preclinical research. This is where we're gonna be doing laboratory and animal testing to answer basic questions about safety of the drug and tolerance of the patients to make sure it's not going to cause adverse effects to them as we try to see if it's going to actually work. Uh, clinical research is what comes next. So that's where we move to the people stage, making sure that they're also safe and effective. And after all of the clinical work is done, we go to an FDA review where they would thoroughly examine uh, the data package that we would create through all of that development preclinical research and clinical trials into a package that they can kind of look at to make sure that what you're getting as a patient is both safe and effective and does what we proclaim that it's going to do. Um, if all of that is, is successful, the FDA will issue us a license to manufacture and distribute that. And then we enter kind of that, that kind of phase at the end, which is about oversight and continuous monitoring. And this is where the FDA will do the post-market safety and every once in a while, they'll come and ask us a bunch of questions. How did you? Do, how is this going? How's that going? And we're kind of continually giving information to and from the FDA, uh, just to make sure that as our product is working through its commercial life cycle, uh, that we're continuing to give safe and effective products. So for the specific dwarf product that Kay was talking about, it kind of looks something like this. Uh, the basis of what we're doing is all based around an SF9 cell which is an insect cell derived from the fall armyworm. And for our system, we're using a baclovirus system. So that comes in a two-part process. You're gonna take your gene of interest, which we're going to express through an SF9 cell. And then we're going to insert that into a DNA sequence between the rep cap portions, as you can see here on the uh, diagram in the middle, um, two parts in between the, uh, the ITRs. And, and that's what kind of builds this AAV vector that we're able to deliver uh, to a patient to go ahead and replace or augment the gene that's not working correctly or that's missing altogether. Um, throughout this entire process, uh, testing and release of that product is governed by a few you know, key principles, safety, quality, purity, potency, identity, strength, um, stability for both the product, stability of the product as it enters into your body, um, so the device that's being used to deliver that has to be compatible. And then finally, what it takes to move our product from our manufacturing facility uh, to the clinic where, where you'll be administering. Um, so as you work, remember those kind of different processes of the drug development process, well, what does that look like? Well, we have a scale up where at the research grade, you're making very, very small amounts of material, uh, test tubes, beakers, flasks, a small amount that you could basically hold in your hand. Um, once we get past the initial, yes, we think this is a uh, promise, we're going to move over to our vector core and our process development group will take over. And they'll make things at a small batch size, so about 50 liters. Uh, basically, something fits on a table. Um, 
And this allows us to kind of continue to do larger scale animal studies, as, as well as start some of that stability data that we talked about. Um, if those are promising, we're going to move up to our pilot plant. This is where we're going to start doing uh, toxicology type work. So medium scale will be at about the 200 liter stage for this. And this is what happens for all of the studies that we do preclinical. And then finally, if that's successful, will be kind of where we are right now, which is looking at a, a CGMP facility where we're going to produce at about a thousand liter scale, a large scale, uh, and this will support all of our inhuman uh, trials going forward. So how does that process look um, from the equipment that we're going to be using? So this is kind of a, a simplified version of what that process flow is going to look like. So again, it's two parts. So we're going to start on the bottom with our proprietary back the virus backman DNA production. Start with something about two mil in a vial that we expand into about a 50 mil flask. That gets expanded into that 50 liter bag through some type of a shaking incubator and then expand it into that 200 liter scale. That's what makes our, our, our primary seed stock. So this allows us to then introduce the gene that we're trying to transfect into your body. And it has a similar process. Starts in a vial, goes to a flask, that gets expanded into multiple flasks through the same shaker incubator. And then both of these come together at the end into about a thousand liter primary processing vessel. Uh, so it's gonna live there. This is about 30 days of work in the upstream process. And where we're going to be growing and expanding into something that we can then take through our purification process. So we do a harvest out of this thousand liter vessel and we go through a, uh, a release process called the harvest, which will allow us to take all of the good proteins that we're looking for out from all of the bad proteins that we're not looking for. So there's a clarification process that will remove particulate, dead cells, impurities. We'll then do a reduction in volume through a concentration step. So this will get us down, you know, about a fifth of the volume that we started with. We then go through a couple of chromatography or filtering steps. There's a capture that'll get rid of some of the, the little particles, a couple of polishes, and finally a nanofiltration, a final formulation to get the concentration that we want right, and into a vial that we can ship as part of our drug delivery. Uh, we wanted to show you a little bit of a time lapse about what our particular facility looked like uh, from start to finish for that construction phase. So this is our current facility, about 100,000 square feet. Started as a CNP warehouse. We took about a year to transform this into the drug manufacturing facility that we have today. laboratory. We talked about all of that release and testing that all of that takes place. This is a look inside of our primary upstream processing suite. This is our 200,000 liter vessel. This is part of uh, the shaker incubator part. We can grow those cells in class. We've got about 50 people that sit in our office to support our ongoing operation. And a look at our completed process. So what enables us to use all of those systems and pieces of equipment that you saw? Well, we've kind of keyed on a few um, computerized systems that are gonna help us make sure that we are delivering safe and effective and efficient drugs throughout that development process. We have a computerized maintenance system. So that's where we take all of the equipment that is in our facility and we computerize the tracking of maintenance, calibration, um, so that we can make sure that it's always available for our manufacturing process. We have an, app, an automated laboratory information system so that all of the testing that's done is easily retrievable and can be put into a data package in case we have to present that data uh, as part of the licensure process. Our manufacturing system uses modern automated solutions and you saw some of them throughout the process. And we've tried to align these with the same types of systems that we use in our PD step that allows us to more rapidly transfer processes from one scale to the other as we move from the 50 liter to the 200 liter to the 1000 liter. All of the recipes, all of that technology is very, very similar, and we're just doing a size expansion. 
We've implemented an electronic inventory management system that allows us to track all of the raw materials and all of the finished products so we know what we need, where it is in the process, and how much we have on hand to deliver to clinics. And finally, the use of disposable technology has helped us reduce the amount of time to get through our licensure process. Uh, we don't have a lot of the same requirements that larger pharmaceuticals that use stainless steel do in terms of cleaning and sterility, because every time we bring a new disposable piece in, it comes pre-sterilized and is available for use immediately without the need for expensive studies to prove that we can have a sterile environment for our processes. As you go through those same five steps, you'll notice there's a complete um, increasing of compliance from the pre-approval, pre-clinical stage where you're looking at establishing the validation of your test equipment and all of the methods that you're going to use to test. For phase one, when you're talking about uh, processes and products that are gonna be going into humans, the facility gets qualified through media fills and environmental testing. This proves that we can manufacture a sterile product that's safe to use. Uh, the process equipment gets uh, qualified through an installation and operational test. Uh, we do have qualification of the test methods to make sure that they're appropriate for the drugs that we're developing. Uh, we come up with some validation master plan that talks about how all of the equipment is tied together and all of the different testing that we have done to ensure product patient uh, safety and then all of the raw materials that get tested as part of that uh, laboratory information. We move on to phase two and those types of trials, you're gonna to have to kind of now look at the validation of your analytical procedures. So this makes it sure that the process is not changing and that the product that you're producing is the same time after time, batch after batch. And then phase three will we'll add another layer of complexity by doing performance qualifications of all of the different equipment and specific media fills to your product to make sure that only that product is going through all of those pieces of equipment. And finally, there's a, a final master uh, manufacturing process validation where three consecutive runs must be done successfully in order to say that the process that we have meets our quality standards. And then as always, once licensure, uh, trend review and analysis from the FDA on an ongoing basis through their inspection program and validation maintenance for biannual requalification of all of our different process equipment. So how can you as patients or advocates of this uh, help us and get involved? Well, uh, genetic testing is the most important um, aspect of this because it gives us an earlier indication of things that may happen to you later in life. So it's important because it can help identify any you know, genetic disorders or genes that are missing before they actually have adverse effects on you. It can confirm or refine the diagnosis, which can in turn help you understand how that condition may affect you and your lifetime. It can also help with identifying other family members who may be at risk of having the condition but are just not showing symptoms. It also helps your medical professional be able to tailor your treatment directly to the symptoms that, that are you know, most affecting you. And as you saw Kay had earlier, um, it's very difficult to figure out which of those different genes is missing or how your symptoms are going to be treated. And it may help you qualify for clinical trials and get you informed about future therapies that you could benefit from. Um, so again, in, in the different phases that we just talked about, one through four, um, in early scientific research, participating in naturally history studies will help us gather more information about uh, populations and how these, these diseases and these genetic defects are occurring, um, that you can contribute samples for research so that we can work on that PD and that laboratory setting to make sure that the products that we're producing are actually helping in addressing your specific conditions, help researchers understand diagnostic challenges, um, so, and then during that, that physical um, clinical phase, one through three, uh, helping individuals and families decide about participating in clinical studies, reviewing clinical study data, and educating regulators about the impact of the therapy on you to make sure that it's safe and effective. And then as always, after uh, the drug has been commercialized and released to the general public, helping companies understand barriers to access, um, what's, what's difficult for you, how you're feeling after um, taking the medication, and participating in those long-term follow-up studies. So I think that brings us to the Q&A. Excellent. Oh, Scott, thank you so much. Um, this is really fascinating. We have some great questions that are coming into the queue here. So I want to remind people, drop any questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to do a quick poll just to kind of gauge people's um, 
interest level here in terms of, would you be willing to join a clinical trial? If eligible, would you be willing to join a clinical trial or research study? And uh, let's give people a, a few seconds here. It's yes, no, or maybe. It's pretty <laughs> simple, three choices to choose from. Um, let's give another second or two here. Interesting. Okay, let's uh, end the poll and share the results. Well, this is very encouraging. 71% said yes, they would be willing um, to join a trial or research study. 3% no, and 26% maybe. And so I, I would assume that they would need just uh, some additional information, obviously, to, to know what the study is about. Um, so thank you. And um, if we could also have Kay on screen, and um, I think what we'll do is get rolling through some of these questions. Um, we have a lot coming in, this is great. Early on in the slide deck, um, you referenced IND. What is IND? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I should have uh, uh, explained it. IND stands for uh, Investigative New Drug Application. So we, we call it the IND, and which is the, uh, the very first stage of the regulatory interaction that just like simply like, uh, okay, well, we have a research and then we have a preclinical data and then uh, you know, all those the, the manufacturing and testing and characterization and all those things that, okay, we believe this is the drug and help. Therefore, we make a package under the FDA guidances, and then we make a package, and, and that is the uh, called the investigative a new drug. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, the new drug, and then that IND uh, submitted to the FDA, and then so FDA uh, start reviewing that. Okay, well, you guys are sponsored tonight therapeutics is claim that this drug has a safety and there's quality and then it's efficacious. Therefore. Mm -hmm. Uh, they allow us to start the human trial. So we call it the first in human trial. So that without, with and without the IND, that is the first barrier from the industry to get over and get aligned with the FDA's uh, clearance. So we call it the IND is very, very important. It's a regulatory milestone for the development of the new drug. So that's an investigative new drug. That's what stands for the IND. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, this person referenced, I thought DCM frequency was much higher at one out of 250 people, not one out of 2,500. Has this changed? Uh, that's, that frequency is, is a all estimated numbers, which means the different people and different questionnaires and then different criteria uh, those frequency, uh, the numbers could be very, uh, very high range of the variance. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, we believe what we have in our uh, data, but we also are open to listen to additional or other perspective. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, I am a PLN patient and a physician. I'm interested in learning about the candidate selection stage for DWARF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, PLN is also uh, another very key uh, important. So the PLN is, is phospholamine band, uh, the gene, uh, which is the, also the part of the CERCA, CERCA and PLN, and then DWARF and CERCA as well. So uh, at this point, we are getting closer every day to uh, reach to a certain point that we call the can uh, <clears throat> development candidate nomination. So uh, we are getting closer, but not quite yet. But uh, we're hoping to uh, get that uh, development candidate nomination stage as soon as possible. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, are there dwarf genetic mutations observed in subsets of patients? Mm -hmm. How are you planning on stratifying patients? Yeah, so uh, that's another excellent question. And uh, that is a little uh, out of my league. It's, uh, it's more uh, our chief medical officers, but I believe uh, the, our clinical team have been uh, developing very uh, effective way of the stratifying uh, the candidates. Okay. So uh, I will just defer to uh, our CMO. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is great. We have a lot of good questions coming in here. Um, 
if you could give a copy of a gene that is mutated in a patient causing DCM, will this help an adult whose heart has been around a long time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely yes. So uh, the most likely the, uh, the genetic disease have uh, two kinds. The one is the hetero, as, you, as you, we all know that human chromosome has the uh, uh, one pair, which mm-hmm. means we have uh, uh, two, two strands of the DNA and get together, make a one, uh, one pair. Mm-hmm. So we call heterozygous or uh, homozygous. If the mutation happens, and each strand that we call is the homozygous patients. Usually, the homozygous patients, the, the symptom and the, uh, the onset of the uh, disease is very early at the baby stage. So, uh, homozygous are very, very seriously ill, and then their life expectancy is pretty low. Mm-hmm. But the pre- prevalence of those, uh, the homozygous patients' uh, frequency is pretty low, very low. So, the, uh, most of the patients will have a symptom. Uh, pass through the adults, and, and then at some point, the onset somehow is the accelerated. Those patients we call the uh, heterozygous, only one pair, okay? one side of the strand had the mutation, but the other side has the uh, intact the gene. So mm-hmm. there is the, there is a still, you know, 50% lower than the gene expression of the no- normal, but still is a lower than the normal. So it it is very difficult when the, on, the disease onset starts. And depending on the uh, age and uh, di- many different uh, aspects can actually determine the severity of the disease. So uh, absolutely the adults with the heterozygous mutant mutation will be our uh, 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 target patient as well. Okay, excellent. And would, would uh, children be able to receive this gene therapy as well? Yes, so uh, we, we also have a plan for uh, treating uh, the heterozygous uh, patients, which is usually just born or you know, within you know, six months and nine months or 10 months, 11 months, 12 months. So those patients are also uh, uh, be a part of the, our clinical development plan. However, because of the safety, as I said, the IND is the very first in human trial. So we don't know how the drug is going to really work. So that's why we have a very long length of the trial in the animals. So the TINAYA has a specifically for very specialized and very, uh, you know, <clears throat> a great plan to testing for the safety first, and then the quality as well as the efficacy of the drug during is preclinical trials. So we have a multiple different species and different size of the heart. And we're testing all those animal studies to learn what kind of the safety issues that may happen. So mm-hmm. before getting into the human, we have a very comprehensive that preclinical trial uh, package has to be in place before even apply mm-hmm. for the IND to the FDA. So, uh, those testing will give us the, uh, uh, some uh, additional confidence, and then the, we will get into the human trial. But again, the baby and adolescents and kids, those are, those, you know, the bellum, they're still growing up. Right? So before uh, administrating our drug to that, that uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very young age children, we want to try with the adult first. So once we have uh, accumulated the data based on the adults, then we will discuss with the uh, FDA and FDA regulators and our scientific evidence, and then we get aligned, and then we get approval for getting into the adolescents or uh, infant or babies. So uh, the timing-wise, it will take a little longer time. However, that's the uh, uh, because of the safety, we want to make sure Efficacious drug is important. However, the safety of our, of our patients is the most important aspect for the tinea therapeutics. So it may take some time, but eventually it may happen if mm-hmm. we can prove the safety and efficacy at other first. Absolutely. Okay, excellent. Um, are there reasons you're not targeting titan mutations? 
Oh yeah, that's a that's a really <laughs> that's a really great question. Uh, as, as you know, the Titan is, is really high uh, frequency; it's about twenty percent of the entire DCN. Uh, the problem uh, we have is the Titan is a gigantic gene, so our AAB, I don't know, associated uh, the virus has the limitation of the gene size, which is about but a little less than five kilobase, which is the five thousand. Uh, the DNA, a Titan is like a really, really big. It's like a more than I don't I don't recall the exact numbers, but it's like more than a thousand. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry, more, more than a million base pair, something like that. So it's way, way above our payload of our AAV vector. However, uh, I believe the uh, uh, there are a few groups in the academics they're trying to uh, split. All those the patterns and try to, uh, you know, come up with some uh, uh, innovative way, but uh, at this point uh, we are not, uh, we, we are not the planning for the patent. Okay. All right. Thank you. I understand. Um, is your program focused on AAV therapies, or are there any small molecule or ASO trials? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, that's a very good uh, question. And the Tinaya Therapeutics, we claim ourselves as a multimodality company. As you can see at the earlier stage, earlier pipeline slide, we have uh, uh, the gene therapy and precision medicine, which is the TN301, is the part of the DCN target, the small molecule. So we are developing both small molecule as well as the gene therapy. The answer is yes, we had, and the TN301 is going to go into the IND in second half of this year. And that small molecule is going to primary target for the DCM patient first. Excellent. And then uh, we will expand to the hepatitis. Okay, excellent. Um, why are you doing all the manufacturing yourself and not outsourcing it? That's another great question. And uh, this has been, you know, we call it the make versus the buy. The make internally or go out to uh, have a, a CDMO. So uh, the 10 years ago, when I started uh, the first day in the gene therapy 2012, there was a very, very small number of the CDMO and uh, handle is the virus. Uh, 10 years later, we still have a hard time to find the CDMO because of that, the slide is showing the number of IND going like exponentially. So the number of the CDMO where it can handle this AAV production is increasing as well. But the number of the demand for the AAV manufacturing is exponentially increased, but the number of the CDMO that qualifies to produce the AAV vector is the linearly increased. So there is the really long lead time, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we believe that our great role wants to be the delivered to the patient as quickly as possible. So that as a part of that strategy, we wanted to invest, internalize the manufacturing so we can be free from those all backlog, the manufacturing problem at the CDMO. So we could produce our drug ASAP. So we can, we can, we can produce the most safest, safest drug and highest quality and most efficacious drug to the patient as quickly as possible using our internalized manufacturing capability. And those are about to put in this year. I can add to that. Um, we wanted to be more in control of our own destiny. As Kay pointed out, um, CDMOs are booking 18, 24 months out. If we had a discovery that came in that wanted us to pivot and accelerate one program over another, it's very difficult to do at a CDMO. It involves a lot of renegotiation of contracts. When we're in charge of that internally, we get to decide what we're going to manufacture, when we're going to manufacture, how much we're going to manufacture. So it gives us a much better flexibility to increase our speed to market, to get uh, products into the hands of patients that are needing them. And it gives us the ability to kind of pivot around what's important, uh, what's the next thing that, that, that could be delivered. And it, it gives us just an incredible advantage uh, that way that we don't have to really go out and ask or negotiate with anyone else or have some other company come in and and kind of buy up some production that we were that we were planning on. So it, it, it's just really about flexibility to better serve patients and the patient market. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, 
Thomas said, sorry, I came late. I didn't see the slide if laminae mutations are candidates for this therapy. Uh, so could you uh, rephrase the question again, please? Um, I guess the question is what specific DCM genetic variants would this therapy be focused on? Oh yeah, right now uh, we are, for the gene therapy side, we are focusing on the DWORF, D-W-O-R-F, which is the, uh, the part, uh, you know, the controller, controller of the, uh, the calcium, uh, calcium channels. And for the small molecule, we have a small molecule uh, program, which is the targeting to the HDAC6, called the HDAC6 inhibitor. The HDAC6 inhibitor, uh, we, we design the small molecule and inhibit the HDAC6, and we uh, observe, this is the very specifically active to the HDAC6 family, uh, <clears throat> the protein, then actually improve the DCN as well as the heparin. Okay, all right, excellent. Um, let's see, so our gene, our gene therapy is only aimed at slowing the progression of DCM or can they reverse it? Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we have seen, uh, you know, that uh, uh, both, some of, some of the, uh, the different mutate, mutated animals may have uh, some reversal as well as the, uh, the uh, improve the symptoms. So, uh, but we haven't uh, made the final decision for the candidate yet. So we are getting closer to uh, figuring out what could be the best for uh, safety as well as the efficacious efficacy. Okay, great, thank you. Um, how close are you to clinical trials? Um, have you had IND talks with the FDA yet? Uh, yeah, so uh, as, as in, the, in the pipeline slide that we are targeting to uh, submit the two INDs this year, the one of them is the uh, TN301, it's the HDX6 inhibitors uh, for, uh, you know, with the small molecule that's also very close to uh, you know, get to uh, uh, the regulatory uh, review. And another one is the TN201, which is the, uh, not the DCN, but it's for the uh, HCM. Uh, that drug is also targeted to get into the IND application in the second half of the 2022. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, how will this drug be administered? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, tried a very comprehensively different way, the local delivery, drug injection, or we call the RCSI, is, is a, a retrograde uh, a, you know, sinus, <laughs> retrograde coronary sinus infusion or uh, you know, IV, very, very simple uh, intravenous uh, injection. So uh, the TN301 is the small molecule, is the oral, uh, oral <clears throat> administration, and the TN301, uh, 201, is the uh, uh, intravenous the delivery administration. Okay, all right, fantastic, thank you. Um, how do you determine what genes go into your pipeline to develop therapies and what role can patients play in driving genes for consideration? Yeah, so during the development candidate selection part, uh, we are not expecting to have any patient involvement because this is the research stage. And then after the research stage, we get into the preclinical uh, testing with the animal models. So after that has been happened, and then we get the you know, development candidate nomination internally, and then get the approved, uh, get the clearance for the IND by the FDA, then we are ready to get into the first in human trial. So before get into the human trial, there are years of effort. So this, for example, Tinaya Therapeutics incepted uh, in October 2016. So it has been 16, uh, six years already went by, and then we are very close to get into the first drug into the human, mm -hmm. second half of this year. So we already spent six years of the research developing and all those efforts now getting into the clinic for, uh, for, with the two drugs. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, the eagerness of the patients to be a part of the, our, uh, our journey. Uh, and I know we, we, we've been waiting for long and not only for us, but also the patient as well. So we are getting very close. So we are very close to get the IND submission this year. And hopefully 
we start trying with the first in him trial as early as possible. Okay, excellent. Well, I know this is a, a forward looking statement, so maybe you can't say this, but many people have the same exact question, which is when do you expect Tanaya's first gene therapy for DCM will be available to market? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really difficult question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I rather not specify the which year. Unfortunately, yeah. I cannot because uh, this is the, as, as I said before, this IND is only allowed for a handful of patients for testing. Mm -hmm. So the phase one, the main testing is the safety because we want to deliver a drug safety first. It has to be safe because otherwise it's going to be a, a big problem. So we once we focus on the safety and a little bit of the efficacy side out of the phase one, and then the FDA will allow us to expand our number of the patients into the second uh, phase two. And then phase two will take years of time. And then after phase two, then we want to have a, another very comprehensive re review process with the FDA. And then they allow us to get into the phase three, which is going to be much, much larger uh, number of the patients. And, and it also takes many years of time. So we are looking into a lot of many years, but depending on the, how the drug works and how safe and how efficacious, those kind of this journey can be very aggressively shortened and or it can be very a uh, length. It's, it's, it's just a right. know, additional extra uh, years. So, so that's the uh, uh, drug development business is a very difficult to accurate, you know, predict the actor. Right. It's right, it's so difficult. Um, I, I wanted to make a note here. Um, Wendy behind the scenes um, just texted and said, if people have further questions, they can also email patient.advocacy at tanayathera.com. And I will include that in the follow-up email that I sent to everyone with the recording. So if people do have questions, they'll have that email address. Again, it's patient.advocacy at tanayathera.com. Um, so uh, if people have questions, they can email yes. Um, let's see, uh, what type of animal will this be tested on, primates or pigs? That's an interesting question. Yes, it is. So we actually have been testing uh, many different animals, very simple mouse, mm -hmm. to the rat and the pig and uh, non-human primate. And so depending on the situation and depending on the, uh, the, the stream of the plant, we have a freedom to test the many different types and size of those animals. For example, non-human primate is as great, uh, but it is the uh, uh, you know very difficult to find. <laughs> and pig, as 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 you all know, the pig has well-known uh, animal model have a very similar anatomy with the humans' uh, heart. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. The genetics are different, so uh, genetics are the, quite different. And you know, it, so NHP case is much closer to the human. Uh, mm -hmm. But the size is the, you know, if we have a, you know, the NHP has also many different species and they have a different size, which is different uh, scale of the heart. So mm -hmm. uh, it is not that really simple, but we are trying to our best to uh, as close as possible to the genetic disease with the, in terms of the size and in terms of the, the many different criteria. So we are carefully designed and we have excellent a preclinical scientist group, and then, uh, they have been a very successfully predict the, the, the safety as well as the efficacy of our yeah, So Janet, it's, it's kind of the answer is like a little bit of all of the above. Um, yes. all, all, of the, all of the research grade always starts in a mouse model. It's the easiest one uh, for you to be able to control and to engineer species that exhibit the, uh, the defect that you're, you're looking at. So that, that's always the starting point. And then as Kate pointed out, um, past that stage, it's, it's really about what is going to most closely exhibit the um, the defect that you're looking for? So it could be a pig, could be a, a non-human primate. So it, it's it's really on a case by case basis. Right. That that makes sense. Um, all right. We have a few more questions here. Um, 
Are there any um, possible safety concerns with the drug being put into the body? Can the gene changes have any effects elsewhere in the body? Yeah, that is true. So as, uh, as we uh, discussed it, the ad administration method of the, our gene therapy drug is the uh, intravenous, which means that this, the, uh, uh, this get into the bloodstream. And then as you know, the bloodstream is going everywhere from the brain, mm -hmm. the liver and, and any other organ in the human. Therefore, that's why it is super critical for us to make sure that when we tested this, the, uh, the safety for the biodistribution, this biodistribution, uh, we using the multiple different size of the animals and then testing, and then which is the, as close to the human dose, and then mm -hmm. testing to the, uh, uh, the NHP or P or uh, whatever animal that we pick. And then the, we go through very, very comprehensive and stringent analysis and see how this, our gene end up. So when we designed our drug, we have a very specific promoter, which is the very specific to the organ, very specific to the type of the cell. So we have the myocyte is the, our target for the cell, for our drug. And then the, this promoter is only activated in the target organ. So they are not specifically expressed in the brain or in any other organs. So it has been tested very comprehensively and our level of confidence is high. Okay, fantastic. And um, that's actually part of what some of that testing we talked about. So that's really the, the primary purpose of that phase one in human trial to make sure that it's only going where it needs to go and that that is not causing any adverse effects anywhere else um, within a body. Okay, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think I'll just take one more question and then um, we'll flip back to the deck and finish up. Is gene therapy a cure? Uh, well, based on the uh, previous two uh, products, yes. And is, is our product going to be a cure? That's a great question and there's a great hope. Okay. And based on the data, uh, we, we hope. But we don't have a clinical data with the human patient yet. So it's a little bit too early, but our goal and our target is a cure. Excellent. And just based on the way that that delivery model works, I mean, gene therapy is intended to be a one-time dose for your lifetime. Wow. And if it's effective, you're going to enable the body's own uh, cell remaking process to take over by replacing or administering an additional um, gene to replace something that's defective or missing. Eventually, if you get enough of it in, in the initial dose, your body will just naturally start reproducing. And that's really one of the advantages of gene therapy because it's a once and done type of medication as opposed to a small molecule, which is continuous throughout your lifetime. That's However, it is, it is not the promise or guarantee. No. That is our theoretically, theoretically yes. uh, a hope, yes. but we have not proved it yet. So uh, okay. let's see uh, if we can uh, reach to a conclusion. Oh, that's fantastic. This is so exciting. I just have to say, um, you know, having worked with the foundation now for uh, a couple of years, um, just seeing these therapies come along and, and uh, what everyone's trying to do in the space is just fantastic. So I want to thank you both for your time tonight and being on with us. Uh, Kay and Scott, thank you so very much. And uh, again, without Tanaya's help, we wouldn't be able to put on these, these sort of webinars and so forth. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, to learn more about the DCM Foundation and dilated cardiomyopathy, you can please visit dcmfoundation.org and follow us on social media. We have a lot going on on social media that you'll wanna check out. To learn more about Tanaya Therapeutics, please visit www.tanayatherapeutics.com and I'll be providing that information in the follow-up email as well to all the registrants. Um, Again, just a huge shout out of thanks to all of our generous sponsors whose uh, company names you see there on your screen. And last, and last but not least, um, our next webinar will be held on Wednesday, August 17th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And the topic is what you should know about cardiomyopathy and silent sleep apnea. The key word there is silent. So keep that in mind. Um, and registration information will be available on our website starting tomorrow. So thank you all so much. Thank you, um, Scott and Kay.
Thank you to all the participants and the incredible, wonderful questions tonight. We're getting some notes of thanks in here. So um, everyone very much appreciates your time as well. So again, stay safe, everyone. Be well and have a great night. And hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank thanks, you very guys. Much. Thank you. Thanks. Take care now. Bye-bye.